Hi, welcome. So in this video, we're going to talk about derivatives and integrals of vector valued functions. So when we have a three dimensional curve, we can actually do calculus on this like we would a two dimensional curve. So what this means is that the calculus we usually do in two dimensions is also going to work in 3D, at least in most cases. So I'm going to start with derivatives and talk a little bit about how those work when we're in three dimensional curves with a vector valued function. And then I'll also talk about antiderivatives or integrals. Starting with derivatives, the way we define the derivative of a vector valued function, r of t, which is x of t, y of t, z of t, is that we write r prime of t, so the derivative of our vector r, we could also write this as the derivative with respect to t of our vector r. This is just going to be equal to the derivative of each of the components. So when we do the derivative, it works out the way we'd want it to. We just take the derivative of the x component, the derivative of the y component, and the derivative of the z component. So you could write this as x prime of t, y prime of t, and z prime of t. So we could go through some of like the complicated limit definitions for why this works with our three dimensional vector, but I don't really think that's that illuminating. And you can sort of just trust that this works the way you'd want it to. We have functions in X, Y, and Z, and so we can take their derivatives as long as their derivative exists. So if the T values correspond to X, Y, and Z values where we're differentiable, then we can take the derivative. In my opinion, you don't need to worry too much about all those details. If you continue on in math and you end up learning more about this stuff, you'll learn then how to handle this more carefully. But for our purposes, you can just trust that you can take the derivative of each of the components and it'll work the way you want it to. So I wrote this out in vector form, but I just want to highlight that we could use the standard basis with the i, j, and k vectors to write this as well. So similarly, if we wrote our vector r of t, as x of t i plus y of t j plus z of t k, then r prime, the derivative of our vector r, would just be x prime of t i plus y prime of t j plus z prime of t k. So you just take each of their derivatives and you keep them with the i, j, and k. So you can choose which of these notations is more comfortable for you, but just know that it's good to be able to go back in between the two, between the vector and the i, j, k notation. So let me show you some examples of what this will look like. This should also get your brain going back to taking some derivatives if it's been a while since you've done that. I'm gonna assume you're fluent in derivatives, but if you need a little more practice, don't worry, it sometimes takes me a while to remember things that I learned a while ago. So for example, let's find the derivative of the vector m of t, which is four sine of t, ln of t, and t cubed plus five t. So why don't you pause, try this out on your own. Remember, we're just taking the derivatives of each of the components. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm sort of assuming you're fluent in derivatives, but don't worry if you need to go back and look up some of the rules again. So we write that the derivative m prime of t is equal to the derivative of sine is cosine. So my first component is four cosine of t. Then in my y component, the derivative of natural log is one over t. And in my z component, I use power rule. So I have three t squared plus five. And it's as simple as that. That's my derivative. Okay, let's try one using ijk notation. So let's find the derivative of the vector p of t, which is equal to e to the 2t i minus 6t j plus cosine of t to the eighth k. Pause the video and try this out on your own. Okay, so we take the derivatives. I see that we're gonna have a chain rule here, so that's gonna be fun. So the derivative p prime of t is equal to the x component or the i component is two e to the two t. So that e to the two t, I do chain rule. The derivative of two t is two. 
and that's why I have that 2 there. Then I subtract off the derivative of 6t, which is just 6, so I have minus 6j. And then I'm going to add the derivative of cosine of t to the 8th. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine, so I'm going to change that to a negative. And then I leave the inside alone, t to the 8th, and multiply by the derivative of that. So 8t to the 7th power. And this is my third component, my k component. And there you go. That's my derivative. So it's really just remembering your derivative rules and putting them in the right positions. Okay, so let's repeat this process and talk about how this works with antiderivatives or integrals. So we say that the antiderivative of our vector valued function r, which is x of t, y of t, z of t, is given by the following. So I use big R of t to represent the antiderivative. And this is just the indefinite integral of r of t with respect to t. So we're just taking the integral of the function we were given to find the antiderivative. And so similar to derivatives, we can just take the antiderivative or the integral of each of the components. So I'm taking the integral of x of t dt, the integral of y of t dt, and the integral of z of t dt. Similarly, if we're looking at the ijk notation, so if we have r of t is xi plus yj plus zk, we can do the big R of t, which is the integral of R of t dt, and we'll just write this as a sum. So we take the integral of x dt times i plus the integral of y dt times j plus the integral of z of t times k. So one unique thing that happens when we do antiderivatives is that we have a plus c value when we're taking a general antiderivative. And so this can be just a little tricky, and this is what makes antiderivatives a little more difficult, in my opinion. And so I'll talk about that when we do one of the examples, and you'll see it more in further videos. But let's try it out on an example. Again, it might have been a while since you've done integrals or antiderivatives, so give yourself some patience as you're doing this. It might take a little bit of review or refreshers for you. So let's find the antiderivative of the vector n of t, which is 7t in the x component, 8 over t in the y component, and 9 cosine of t in the z component. So why don't you pause, try this on your own. Remember you're taking the integral or the antiderivative of each of the components. Okay, so I'm going to write big N of t to represent my antiderivative. This is just how I typically do it. And this is the integral of our vector N of t with respect to t. So what I'm really doing is taking the integral of each of the components, so I'll write that out. I'm integrating 7t dt, I'm integrating 8 over t dt, and I'm integrating 9 cosine of t dt. So when I do this, I'm just going to go component by component. So first, I have 7 over 2 t squared, so I'm increasing the power and dividing by that new power. And I'm going to just put plus c here because this could be any constant for our general antiderivative. Then in the next component, the antiderivative of 1 over t is natural log of absolute value of t, and I have that 8 there, so I'm just going to get 8 natural log of t. And again, I put the plus c in to represent that there could be some constant. Then in the third component, the antiderivative of cosine is sine, and so I have 9 sine of t plus c in my z component. So I've written plus c on each component. This doesn't mean that each of these has the same constant attached to it, it's just supposed to represent any general constant. So when we convert this to ijk notation, if you want to write it that way, we have 7 over 2 t squared times i plus 8 natural log of t j plus 9 sine of t k, and the way we typically do this is we just add 1 plus c at the very end. You can imagine if we added up all of those constants and sort of collected them into 1 plus c that we put on the end of our antiderivative. But what's important to note here really is just that if you're asked to find an integral of a vector valued function, you just do the antiderivatives of each of the components, just like you would do with the derivatives by taking the derivative of each of the components. 
All right, so those are the basics of taking derivatives and finding antiderivatives in our vector valued functions. This will become especially useful once we start doing problems involving kinematics with position, velocity, and acceleration. But for now, you can just practice finding the derivatives or antiderivatives of our vector valued functions. Thanks so much for watching, and I will talk to you in the next one.